was that the time when you crossed that 50 odd mark and suddenly went to hundreds the time when you actually introspected ki hamara culture hai kya like like what's our culture or had you guys decoded it earlier on nahi nahi wo hundreds pe the first person talked about it ultimately <laughs> only after we were maybe 1500 did we actually <laughs> kind of uh, really articulate Hello and welcome. I'm Shashank Mehta, founder at The Whole Truth Foods. As the founder of a young startup, I've seen firsthand the immense challenges that come with starting and scaling a company. No founder can be fully prepared for what entrepreneurship looks like, but we can definitely learn from the giants who've come before us. Stalwart founders who've built great companies and who've perhaps faced those very same challenges and overcome them. On this podcast, I speak to them founder to founder and try and unearth the whole truth of starting up. Let's begin. Okay, hey folks, please join me in welcoming Shri Harsha Majetti or Harsha as I assume most people call him. Harsha is the co-founder and the CEO of one of India's biggest and most awesome startups, Swiggy. He's also a dear friend and one of the smartest and more importantly one of the most helpful people i've come across in the indian startup ecosystem harsha such a pleasure having you and thank you so much for being here hey thank you sashank it's uh, it's great to be here thanks for thinking of me uh, big fan of everything that you do and it's been a privilege seeing you from the sidelines happy to chat today anything about my journey and my experiences awesome thank you so much for the kind words and and as you know today i want to talk to you about you know how do you go from thinking like a small company to thinking like a big company now you know for the first 3 years of your existence you were not a unicorn and for the last 3 years you were so like while i know that you know the 1 billion dollar mark is arbitrary what i'm trying to understand is in your head as the founder when do you go from thinking like a small company to thinking like a big company yeah so i think uh, there's these two concepts the one is the machine which is the business and then there's the machine that runs the machine which is the which is the company the culture the ways of working how you are structured etc so soon as i mean as you go through your journey there comes a point in at which every founder asks themselves is the machine that's making the machine working well and uh, in the beginning you're just uh, a bunch of insurgents and then you have the 10 or 15 folks that do and it's just all machine just need to go and um build what we want to but um at some point in that journey that realization hits you saying i have to take a step back and think about the uh the machine the other machine and that's i guess for us the first moment was when we went from maybe 40 50 um team members in the team to i guess a few hundred in a matter of 6 uh, months when we had to go through um a crazy scaling journey in 2015 and uh, that's when this starts hitting you because then there are various folks who joined in early before the company's whole onboarding and culture everything is verbalized and then you start hearing back from people saying hey dude there feels like there are multiple subcultures inside the company and we need to start uh, figuring out uh, how to tame this in how to actually articulate to ourselves and maybe that was the first big moment for me it's not a lot defined by how large the company is or how much the valuation is but you just know that okay things have things have escalated quickly so most of my vantage points are on on the inside actually so while well, i'm going to come back and talk about the culture piece in a bit more depth later <laughs> on one question i do want to know is uh, was that the time when you crossed that 50 odd mark and suddenly went to hundreds the time when you actually introspected ki hamara culture hai kya like like what's our culture or had you guys decoded it earlier on nahi nahi wo hundreds pe the first person talked about it ultimately <laughs> only after we were maybe 1500 did we actually <laughs> kind of uh, really articulate and make a make a deliberate effort otherwise it was still maybe we were solving for culture but in a very tribal way in mm-hmm. not in a way that you could just rely on the other leaders to act on every time so just each had their own view of uh, what is the swiggy way of working and some people still thrived and got promoted some people didn't and there was a 70% 60% adherence let's say to uh, what we eventually articulate 
for the decisions taken post fact one of the things there though shashank is uh, you have to keep thinking small to think big at every single stage of the journey and there's this amazing podcast by brian chesky that's available on spotify where he talks about handcrafted so that handcrafted nature is is just a just has to be a big part of who you are no matter what role you do in the organization because yes you are large but um, large comes with all things unsexy which is you know scaling and standardization and commoditization so that you can do more of it but uh, you have to and we've not done it on in every year consistently it's just something that we're rediscovering saying we need to uh, go back think small think one user and think about a magical experience that we can create from them instead of saying scale metrics um move metrics at scale alone and uh, that is an engine that is important whether it is to elevate the current experience or st- or to completely do crazy new experiences now i think that's a very interesting one because it makes me wonder currently like we are very small so we don't have that dilemma uh, of you know if if there are 10 options of things to do i as a founder don't need to put on the lens of will this become a billion does this have the potential to become a billion dollar bet or not uh but in your case for the needle to move it needs to have that potential so two two parts to the question a uh when uh, did you start wearing that hat in uh resource allocation meetings where you felt i will re- allocate resource only to bets which can become that large that they move the needle and b uh to your point of all big things need to start small because that's where magic happens how do you calibrate the two how do you balance the two actually there is no balance because they are on two different paradigms i think uh, in general we've never greenlit anything that we thought was going to be small either it was going to make a dent either directly as a business or indirectly through some other uh, means if neither didn't happen it's not like we greenlit them uh, anymore and if we greenlit something it's because we didn't know better but if something was deliberately smaller than um you know a biggish biggish dent on our own uh, impact and size we wouldn't green light them but that's different right that is so we are think big when it comes to opportunities saying we have to go after large opportunities and solve large problems for the consumer but to do that to solve that big problem you have to think small and you have to think n is equal to 1 and not get ahead of yourself and say how can i serve 500000 users um because then you suck out the artisanal oxygen out of it on day 1 and it's super important uh, on day 1 to figure out what a beautiful experience for one customer would look like and then kind of build out along the way it's not something that we've perfected but at least have a deep awareness of as an organization after collecting some scar tissue from some of the things that we did um, that weren't exactly um, think small when they started but when did you go from uh, uh, you know the uh, a stage where you could do 10 quick small low hanging fruits to get the growth that you needed to needing to do these one or two really big ones without which uh, the needle wouldn't move when when did that shift uh, happen because i assume you can't be doing like 50 small things anymore uh, there must have come a point where you switched no actually you'd be surprised the number of small things uh, increase as the company scales because even the small things actually have meaningful impact and in the whole humdrum and prioritization of things you also realize that the bigger things um are much harder to pull off as the organization scales as there are too many um folks in the team that need to be aligned cross team collaboration and all of that which means that every company's roadmap will be a mixture of two three big things and a bunch of medium things and a bigger bunch of smaller things and to that is i guess a large companies should be a large companies roadmap not because you're finding it harder to organize internally because at scale every small 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 copy changes changes our economics uh, by 1 2% sometimes so you have to be on the hunt for newer opportunities so we don't have a an emphasis or an outsized skew on just the big moves we love big moves but the, the the more big moves you make it's harder to pull off also for any organization so because priorities are harder to establish with everyone so for example this year we have a few core goals on food and then we've said 
um, Instamart is a very, very big focus area for us. So we've classified some of these as what we call management team goals, um, which are the most important. So now you have to go after it no matter what. There may be some big bets of the future, but our seeds today. So you just give yeah, them a team and give them a budget and then do some skunk works projects on the side. So yeah, actually you do more smaller things as you go. I want to deep dive into that. These seeds of today, which might take six, eight, ten months to germinate. Or in, never. Uh, or never. Yeah. Right. Uh, how do you uh, ring fence them from the orb? How do you incubate the small stuff so that there isn't pressure on that team from day one to start delivering? Uh, simple things, right? I think there's a lot of over communication that needs to be done. My co-founder Nandan oversees all things uh, new exclusively. I'm very jealous of his job. Uh, and uh, he makes it a point to over communicate to teams about uh, the need for leaner smaller teams that can just go quickly iterate and not get hung up in um, large scale decision making because the impact is going to be in like a very small surface areas and then figure out how to form like a different engineering contract with the engineering leaders saying when we are building this this is the way we will build it we will not build it like a uh, food delivery feature where uh, you have to think about like a hundred check metrics. It's super hard, but we uh, try nevertheless. Another thing is uh, we don't do heavyweight reviews for seeds until it's been a certain amount of time. It's not like the entire management team coming in and chewing on you, um, saying that where is this, what do you have to show for yet. At least give the uh, two, three, four quarters before you have something to show for. So. Uh, Nandan keeps talking about this concept which actually came first from Jeff Bezos calling the joy of wandering. So the wandering journey is very, very important in zero to one. And uh, we just make sure we have that healthy respect for wandering and don't don't yank the chain for zero to one. One uh, personal experience I have from having worked in Unilever is... Uh... Uh, I don't think big companies have the ability or uh, know how to treat failure, which is an essential component of these seed new bets, right? That that by probabilistic nature of things, they will, like more than half will fail. How do you performance manage and treat the teams which are working on something that didn't go to fruition and, and fell flat on its face? Right. So again, that's been a journey for the company, uh, something that I'm kind of fully cognizant of from the last couple of years of experience. I think this whole focus on the inputs is a great thing. However, uh, mastering the art of watering down the whole work of an individual to the inputs is not an easy one as well. Organizations don't have the time. Again, it's all number aya kya, number nahi aya kya. And uh, it's very hard. So you have to invest the extra amount of work to make sure that you're going closer and closer to the inputs and not just the outcome. So where not fully on our journey there. I'd say probably 10% done um, on that. People haven't been penalized per se for failing, at least in the zero to ones. Again, failure is on multiple aspects, right? If your um, operating excellence in core last mile operations is not good, then that's a, that's not a the same failure as a failure because of the ambiguity um, and because of the quality of the wandering. So I guess the important thing is to separate from it. I, I think... We've gotten to a stage where there are no penalties for failure. However, uh, I was speaking with um, Harsh Mariwala recently, a couple of months or three months back, and I learned that they have an award called the Intelligent Failure um, in Mariko, where they're celebrating well-executed failures. So that was for me an aha moment, something that I need to do more internally because I feel we have gravitated into like you know just only celebrating the winners. And to actually celebrate uh, thoughtful risk taking, you'll have to celebrate the, the intelligent failures as well. So it's a note for me and my team to do more. And that's quite tough, right? In the absence of outputs, objectively judging quality of input, uh, because you can't really just judge it by hard work and, and how much time you saw people spend at it. Uh, and yeah, so so any any insights and thoughts on that? That's a big open topic I know in in most big firms. And this Marico example I didn't know of. I think that's a great one for the Unilevers and PNGs of the world also to implement. They don't have it. But any insights on that? How do you judge great input in the in the presence of bad output? 
I, I think as leaders, you'd still know going in how how much thought the team put into um, what the consumer might want, how much effort they did in listening to the consumer, how much um, agency they showed internally to break barriers that were coming their way. Uh, I guess these are all key tenets of uh, being successful in anything new to one. Have that curious mindset, have that relentless mindset and just... Uh, you know, show very, very high agency. And the last thing would be the quality of the team that you uh, put together. If it is an Avengers type team and an Avengers type effort, Avengers nahi hua to bhi, I think you can tell. So it's not that hard. You, you will always be seen by, it's not objective or it's not like 100% out of, uh, whatever, 100 out of 100 people in the company can agree with you. But who yeah. cares? Got it. I want to go back to the scaling piece where you said there's the machine and then there's the machine running the machine. Right. Uh, how much of your time nowadays do you spend on both of those, like on the machine and on the machine running the machine? Right. So in my office hours or meeting hours, it would be more like 70% machine and 30% machine running the machine. Uh, but in off meeting hours, it would be reverse. Mm. Mm. Okay, so I was saying, I want to go back to the culture point that we touched upon earlier, where you said that it was at around 1500 odd folks that you first decoded and started, you know, encoding what your culture is. And by that time, obviously, some form of culture had already, would have already taken hold. You had a culture by then. Yes. So the, the exercise at that point of time was, uh, ab ye jo hai, let's decode it and encode it from here onwards so that from 1500 to 10,000 remains the same or was it, oh shit, something that we didn't even think of has now become, we need to first change it a bit because this is not what we are going for and then we will encode it. What, right. what that journey? No, that journey, the eventual outcome was 70% of the behaviors that were already being generally maintained throughout the company, which we were really happy for. And the rest 20-30% that were only being displayed in parts of the company that really separated the great from the good. And the core team came together to say, today we have this challenge and unless we tackle this at scale, we're going to be in trouble. So it was a mix of both and we were actually quite candid when we opened it up to the entire company also saying these are the things where I think we're already doing well, must continue. Um, in some places, there was a stop that was explicitly mentioned saying we should stop doing some of this. And there are some places where we said we should start doing some of these. Uh, the culture doc is a living organism. And uh, yeah. I think one, one thing we should do, actually, we are refreshing our values as we speak uh, for the first time after we launched it in 2016. Um, and uh, now feel like I should just look at it for every quarter and see how I want to fine tune even sub bullet points or sub copy in a value to just make sure that you're constantly iterating on it. Treating it like a living organism is very important. Are you going to just change it every week? Um, heck no. But maybe in a seven years old company, changing it once uh, in two years and then waiting for another four or five years is also too long. Do you, uh, uh, going back to the, uh, one of the seed beds point, do you consciously create a subculture in teams which are executing zero to one projects? Yes. And that's Definitely. the thing of the team? Actually, you know what? The subculture doesn't change the value. Yeah, yeah. It is just the manifestation of the value. What you think is great is very different in a zero to one from like a scale entity. So you just over communicate what that uh, zero to one. Uh, and maybe, the, maybe the weightages to different values might change. Is it? Correct. Correct. Of course. And now that you're such a huge org, how do you as the founder who early on would have had, uh, you know, a complete pulse of the org, how do you keep a finger on the pulse of the org now? I think even though the org has gotten larger, my, my radar is still high because I don't, I mean, I don't and I don't encourage anyone also to uh, think about boundaries in the context of an organization. Fundamentality means that, that there is nothing that's not your job. And when I'm curious and when there's a specific anecdote, then I just go dive deep, um, make a few calls to a team member, no matter how junior they are and which part of the 
system they are in to just understand it better and so organically because of that curious uh you know paranoid side of me for me i have just ended up building pipes across the organization and those pipes we are initiated because of some work but then we meet in the settings and if more people you know realize that i'm a, you know approachable then generally like a lot of conversations trickle um organically so i think uh, a lot of it still leans on um tribal tribal systems of course we are now using um software sentiment analysis surveys and all of that as well but i guess the both are important the data and the anecdotes yeah, are both yeah. important i still run uh, more than i probably should acknowledge on anecdotes <laughs> i guess uh, i'm i'm hazarding a guess here that that surveys etc are or, or actually the anecdotes are good to form hypotheses and the surveys are good to then confirm or deny them mm-hmm. is that how you operate or partly partly but i think this whole survey is understanding um, how people are feeling all of this sometimes the right anecdotes don't reach you but then mm-hmm. the data actually does catch that so it allows you to expand your list of hypotheses the why why you know only the yeah. why so it just widens your net to hunt for more areas of um, improvement but this thing of having multiple pipes down to junior janta to get the vibe and the pulse of the company now you have a lot of senior leaders between you and them do you uh, worry about uh, you know breaking ranks etc or or that's not something that ever crosses your mind actually that's never crossed my mind i've gotten this feedback from one two folks who joined from larger organization some weren't even fans of it but i couldn't care this is exactly the company that i wanted to build even if i were to be working in a junior level in swiggy um being able to cross ranks is a very energizing thing shouldn't abuse it you shouldn't do too much of it but the line being open is a very important one i don't know it seems too dogmatic to break ranks if i see my leaders too obsessed on breaking ranks then i'm going to have a tough conversation <laughs> what's the problem no i i asked precisely because of that because again in in big in these other big firms which have gotten big over 50 years over the last 50 years uh, breaking ranks is a very very uh, taboo thing especially in uh, uh a uh, human resource heavy sales driven orgs like right. the hierarchy runs like military right and and breaking ranks is a thing right so it's interesting right. to know how a founder keeps uh, his or her connect with the org and there is no other way uh, right. you will always get the soup of the soup of the soup of the soup uh, yeah you're going to always get this warm and fuzzy view you and yeah. you start drinking too much of the cool aid yeah yeah which which brings me to uh, the final thing i want to talk in depth about how do you as a founder change when you go from small to big 50 to 5000 uh, 100 million to 5 billion <laughs> how do you as a founder change i think the i mean the skill or the capability that grows the most on your founding journey is empathy um i think uh, i was not a big part of teams or i was a very um, all about myself kind of person even if i would travel i would travel alone because i didn't want to be in a group where i had to like get everyone along and i just wanted to do my thing so for me um originally the realization dawned in 2016 that that side of me has a serious conflict with this side of me running a company fulfilling my dreams it was almost like a forcing function i under, unless i understand what makes people take they or you know what their emotions are what their challenges are it, you really can't go and hit your own um ambition for impact in life so it was just a big aha moment for me and since then i have just grown to be a a bigger and bigger student of um this subject empathy in terms of understanding teams motivations um is the biggest one and that was helpful for me as i managed managers as i managed leaders as i managed cxos etc um and that's one bit i guess the second thing is as a founder as you scale you're going to have a lot of these challenges uh, which you'll unfortunately have to solve on your own for your company 
every time is you know org design and org structure and ways of working and um, all of that those two i guess are they're really really big learnings otherwise the business is not like um suddenly very different from the business it was 3 months anymore it is going to be a more gradual process but i guess those are the most important bits but uh, you know you said when when you were uh, in the initial phases you were a lone traveler you didn't like big groups not you know hang around with people etc no 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 i liked hanging around with people but i just uh, wanted to just have my way have your own so this, yeah i have my own thing like i want to do this so yeah. i want to do this it's just not the same anymore hmm i f- i find that like and, and i assume that that at that point of time was a intrinsic part of who you are like like Correct. that's that's who you were as a person right and and Correct. and these are the these intrinsic ways of being are the toughest ones to override with your logical brain right your logical correct. realizes that there is a lacuna that i need to fill but... correct 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 so how how does one traverse very easy journey? it's very easy your company is not going to be around if you don't fix it so that way it was a very forcing function thing for me if i was probably in a job where the stakes were lesser then i probably mm-hmm. would have figured out ways to not grow it i couldn't humanly see how i could still be building this company fulfilling my dream if i didn't do that so it's just life threatening uh, <laughs> ailment that i had to somehow get rid of and and on the org design subject is is there some course material there is there something that you look for inspiration for for that piece yeah i mean that the inspiration there is mostly other companies known for um their practices their history their success in consistently being excellent on operating setup so that is one big part and the second one is uh, is just our own scar tissue we've made so many mistakes that you know each time we make we don't let that uh, go waste so those two are this how do you uh, how do you record it how do you uh, code it record the mistake How, how do you record the scar tissue so that it becomes part of the org's memory, not just your memory? So I guess that's why, right? We collected so much scar tissue in the last one, one and a half year. Things came to a head. We have a refreshed values, this thing, but it shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be spiky step function moves. So yeah. that's why I said over communicating whenever you see parts of this frame is important. We've talked ad nauseum about specific mistakes and a codified. in smaller ways but uh, some of these are i think just the ways right so we do have a lot of practices originally we went we felt like our um, recruitment process was very broken where anybody would come into the panel in fact in the beginning it would be just one hiring manager and two three friends and he would just call them are kaisa laga maza hai na conversation mein le raha and the other person would say chalo theek hai zarurat hai to le le Mm-hmm. but now changes because then you have to figure out how to scale the machine and then we introduced a process where um people who don't have a vested interest at all in the hiring are going to come and talk about do i think this individual fits into swiggy does she display the values that um, we want etc and then you create some more process to make sure that uh, that whole thing scales so those are the codification things so for example if a leader were to come in today and uh, not be diligent enough in an interview debrief then they'd be called out um, automatically saying ye kya this doesn't even explain the why why did you like this person's curiosity i couldn't read your one pager and understand why you felt that so explain mm-hmm. to me so you know those are i think a written form documentation for important processes mm-hmm. is a very important course correction mechanism and the debriefing piece is a is a process that you guys set After yeah. you resolve the problem, yeah, yeah. After we said that, okay, this part is frame. What have other good companies done? Again, like a lot of problems, we go to Amazon <laughs> and ask what have they done because they've really invented the machine that builds the machine. Yeah, a lot of companies in the world have invented many machines, but on inventing the second machine, very few companies have. Got it. Okay, I want to end by asking you as you scale. Uh, when do you turn your gaze from growth to profits yeah there are various parts of our journey where we've had our gaze only on one thing um in 2017 to 2018 we were turning our gaze on both 
then we just turned our gaze only on growth then we turned our gaze only on cost now we're back to turning our gaze on both so even as a startup or that's not nothing to do with a um small company or a large company as lo- actually as long as you're in a small company mode you will have to um find yourself in all of these three phases right now as the company gets larger then you start con- being in this turn your gaze on both a lot more so if i would say that the first four years we were in turn your gaze on both was uh, 25% of the time right now it's going to be like a lot more percentage again it's as a as our business expands right it's also yeah. not the same like we'll have a growth plus pnl focus on food delivery and the growth only focus on instama and mm-hmm. even more growth only on the seeds so it's not a yeah very easy classification yeah no uh, i i get you but what i'm thinking is you know uh, in the like again in the stage that we are in in the seed series a sort of stage you are you're still trying to es- get to escape velocity so that you don't come crashing down to mother earth right now mm-hmm. once you once you escape gravity uh, at least on on your initial bet forget about the other bets that come in the future you you get to have that choice of whether i still want to keep the boosters on at any mm-hmm. cost or or do i want to start optimizing for efficiency because i don't need that much thrust right now uh, mm-hmm. i was checking for that like is there a conscious time when one there is uh, right now it is all very clear due to circumstances because there was a super competitive phase and then there was covid and all the crazy that happened to the business we were in complete uh, opposite poles for 2019 and 2020 2021 for us is actually the balanced view of life you got it Got it. 2021 onwards, rather. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. On that, on that hopeful note, thank you so much for making the time. I am always Super. amazed by uh, uh, your level of insight and introspection, and the speed at which Swiggy continues to grow. So, more power to you and your team. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Shashank. Cheers. Thank you. If you like this episode don't forget to hit like and subscribe to our channel so we can continue making more of these and tell us who you'd like us to host next in the comments below ciao for now